I'm that assuming they're gonna kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I am here live at the Sandsport Super Show in Orange County, California. Uh, we are at the Orange County Fairgrounds and in the Evo Evolution Power Sports booth, joined by some very special guests. And if you are have been in the industry for a while, you probably know exactly who you're looking at if you're on <laughs> YouTube. Uh, but uh, I have uh, Jimmy and Sam here. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves and tell us uh, kind of what your roles are in the organization and we'll get into it. For some reason, I'm a little bit nervous about this interview <laughs> with that build, with that build up. Uh, my name is Jim Zacone, uh, co-owner of Evolution Power Sports. Uh, my brother and I, Todd, uh, we started the company about uh, 12 years ago and uh, very fortunate to be involved in such a great industry. And Sam? Uh, I'm Sam Rohde. I started with Evo just over a year ago, and I am the Evo Sam that you see on Facebook. So you're so. the fresh blood of the group. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I am. And what do you do inside the, the Evo warehouse? So all the like comments and things like that, some of the posting and the responses on Facebook, as well as um, managing a general inbox and things like that. So answering the questions that come in, basically an internet presence for Evo. So basically, when you're online trash talking Evo, she's the one talking back to you and giving you a smart aleck response. Sending you personal messages. <laughs> haunting your DMs. Online, haunting your so DMs. She, she's the reverse of sliding in the DMs. She just comes in with a hammer and starts breaking down your walls. So, um, no, Sam has a great way with people. You know? That's why she's, she's in that role. She just disarms people, and you know, it's, it's a, it's a great quality. One of my favorite things yeah. about online is you go to some of these accounts, like um, like the Wendy's account or like the Burger King account, where they're like just getting real snarky with the people online and just throwing it right back at them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we're here at the show. Uh, just give us a little bit of a rundown of the show so far, and you know how it's gone for you, and what you guys are doing, and talking with the consumers, and kind of how that's going. Uh, it's been a great show. I mean, uh, you know, compared to last year which was you know kind of crazy uh, in phoenix when we got shut down at noon the first oh, day was it was horrible. um but uh it seems like we're back to you know normal sand sports super show type uh turnout's great i mean there's a lot of people here a lot of vendors here probably a little bit less than than uh maybe a couple years ago but um nonetheless i mean it's you know it's the place is full and it looks like you know the rest of the weekend is going to be fantastic and Sam, how are kind of like the consumers reacting to the product and the technology and, and all that? How are they starting to get on vocal online and seeing, you know, are they sharing stuff or are they buying stuff and then showing it off? Like, what's the commonality between the people at the show and the people online? So I haven't really checked the online presence since I've been here, but I've been like keeping an eye on the messages and things like that. I don't like know. That, she that just said in. she wasn't doing her job. So that's what I heard. Uh, well, I'm actually the code shooter provisioner <laughs> there we go. this weekend. So, I mean, based on being up there and provisioning code shooters and stuff like that, there's just they're really excited about you know the new code shooter coming out and i've done a lot for the so let's talk that about that a little bit that just came out what a couple weeks ago something uh, like that it, it was about six ago. weeks ago oh that's right i've been at trade shows i haven't been paying attention about everything. <laughs> so tell us a little bit of what what it is and why it's important well so code shooter is the first app-based um ecu programming device in the utv market okay and it's something that we've been working on for about three years, uh, my brother did uh, most of the, you know, spearheading of that project and uh, saw it through to uh, completion. And it's a fabulous product, and it's and it's really at the very early stages of the of the development. So it's a product that, yeah, it, it works great today. It does things great today, but the things that we have coming for it are just going to blow people's minds. So it's you know, it's it's so a great. So this is a product. device that you plug into your harness inside the inside the dash that plugs into your your can system on the car right and then that is what it enables you to program it via your app and, and tell it what tune you want it, exactly so so rather than having the um you know the device that you know you you have to plug into the car and you know have the tunes like it it automatically you know so everybody has a phone right okay so so that's why we did it we, we felt like you can't get better technology than phone technology. It's waterproof. It's, you know, everybody has one, you know, either an Apple or an Android phone. And so let's let let's use the power of the of the phone and then have a more simple device that connects to the car and then put really advanced features into the app. OK, um, which is, you know, where where the world is going. I mean, everything is app driven. So and for the consumer. Now, like when, it, when we provision a code shooter to go out, 
it has their information in there, what tunes they're entitled to. So all they do is they download the app, they plug it into their car, uh, they'll have to you know, put their contact information in, accept some terms, but then boom, your your tunes show up right there. So there's no waiting. Uh, there's no waiting for anybody to enable anything. You download your tune um, and you're done. Okay. So, so in the traditional world of like ECU flashing, right? Like you would go into a shop or whatever, you have your authorized vendor that's going to do it. They come in, they have the, the official uh, device to plug into your car and the software to do it. And then they run uh, a license off to an Evo or to whoever. Uh, they download that tune for that car, that specific person that's licensed to them, that car, they put it on the car for you, and then you're, that's all you get. Like, it's in the car, right? Yeah, and there's still a lot of customers that want it that way. They, they want to go visit a dealer. They want the dealer to do all the work. They're never going to run anything but what the dealer puts in. But, but a lot of, you know, just, just like with anything else, you know, in this industry, people want it the way they want it, or many people want it the way they want it. So someday they want to run 91. Another day they want to go racing. So they have the ability to change, you know, between tunes, um, you know, according to what their, you know, their mission is for the day. So like what, what me and my guys up in the Pacific Northwest do uh, is quite frequently we'll be on, on one day up in the mountains at high elevation tearing up a, high, a side hill or something or just ripping down fire roads or something. And then the next day we'll be traveling over to the dunes and wanting to do a dunes ride. Right. And that's two completely different power bands that you want to utilize. And so this could be a solution for that where in the mountains you're, you're more of uh, getting more of that low end torque. And then at the, in the sand dunes you're able to get that pushed out harder on the, on the side face of the hill or whatever you're doing. Um, so that's a really great solution for guys that are multi-terrain you know, terrain and multi-geographically riding. Exactly. So uh, let's talk a little backstory. You mentioned you and your brother kind of were the OGs of all this. Kind of give us the kind of the history there and where you came from. Well, so my brother and I, um, my brother owned Evolution Motorsports, was a, which was a motorsports company back in the uh, early 2000s. Uh, they did high-end Porsche and Audi uh, type uh, tuning and upgrades similar to what we do today. Uh, and around 2009, you know, uh, you know, after the, the financial crisis of, you know, 08, you know, he and I decided that we wanted to do, you know, we we're both very passionate about off-road, the off-road industry, both snowmobiling. Uh, he was more into the dirt stuff, but I was heavily into the, the snowmobiling stuff. And so we, we said, all right, we're going to go down this road. Uh, we fully committed to it. And we, uh, we started developing parts and tuning for snowmobiles. And that's really what launched our company. Um, was the snowmobile stuff, and that's all we sold for the first you know year and a half was was snowmobile parts and tuning, and and the company exploded just on you know what we were doing for snowmobiles. But then we looked at it, and we're like, well, we got two families to feed here. How are we gonna you know I mean you know snowmobile season is like three months out of the year, um, and he like I said he was into the off road scene in Phoenix. He lived in Phoenix at the time, and uh, you know he uh, he had a Rhino. So he was one of the original Rhino owners <laughs> right. you know down in phoenix lone star long travel you know but the thing had like 40 horsepower right it was like right. glorified golf cart um but back then that was a lot it was a lot it was a lot but it wasn't really that much fun compared right. to where we are today and so you know once articat released the wildcat you know we built every single part that we could build for that car you know it, it, you know ar you know because it, it was a decent car but it wasn't going to go through the dunes, you know, the way we want to run through the dunes. I mean, you're breaking A arms and, you know, trailing arms. It was underpowered, so we built a turbo kit for it. Um, and really, that's what launched us into the the side by side world was the was the OG Wildcat. So, and we were already in that known for Articat stuff at the time. Right. Um, and then what happened was, you know, Articat kind of fell off the map pretty quickly when, when Can-Am released the, uh, the XDS Turbo in 2015. And then when Polaris released the Razor Turbo in 2016, you know, that was our sweet spot, was these factory turbocharged vehicles. Right. And, and that's really what uh, propelled us, you know, to where we are today. So the snowmobile world, you know, down in the southern desert, there's really not much going on down there. <laughs> and and the elevation changes and all that stuff all regarding tuning is completely different than up in the mountains, right? So how did you guys kind of dive into transitioning from high elevation, you know, high torque, high rev, to, down to transitioning into these turbo models that you had a CVT, which is similar to a snowmobile, exactly. uh, but applied completely differently through the transmission. So how was that transition? Well, the, the good thing is, is that, you know, the the 
ECUs have become more sophisticated over time, right? So it's not like in the olden days where you had to jet a snowmobile for the elevation and then rejet it when you go down, you know, to sea level. Uh, a lot of it is self-compensating, but what we did learn is that, you know, when you develop a tune, you have to test it in both places, right? Because sometimes, you know, what works at sea level or in the sand will not work in the mountains. And, and so that's part of our... Uh, you know, testing regimen is that we got to go to both places um, and, and trail riding too and racing and, you know, all of the other things we do to validate uh, the tunes that we put out. Right. And so it, over the last few years, uh, Evo's, I, I, I don't want to say a few years, but over the last few years, we've gotten really, really strong foothold in the race scene with mm -hmm. all these guys that are coming out with um, these high horsepower Can-Ams and that's a testament to the evolution of these cars, right? Like, you yeah. know, when Can-Am came out in 17 with their Maverick and said, you know, we're going to dominate the horsepower scene, uh, not only did they win on looks and, and, you know, chassis, you know, stuff for the desert, but they also won on the on the capability of that motor and, and what you could do with it. So, um, you know, when, when you guys jumped into, because you guys were on Razors for a long time and then you jumped heavy into the Can-Am scene, which paid off great because now everybody's running Evo tunes and, and <laughs> stuff. Um, uh, but what was the transition like going from like a, the, the Polaris two cylinder to like the, the kind of like high overhead triple cylinder from, from BRP? Well, um, well, first of all, you know, nobody knew how good the Can-Am was when it came out in right. 17, right? So, you know, it was, you know, you, if you went out to Glamis in 2015, you would see 90% razors, maybe 7% Can-Am, and then you'd mix in like a Honda and a Wildcat <laughs> right. in there, right? So, so nobody really knew how good it was going to be, but we got, we adopted it early because, you know, part of the reason was S3, who we were very closely aligned with and, and involved in the race team. You know, they saw the potential, same thing with Lone Star. So we jumped in it hard. And I'll never forget, we went out to Camp Razor that first year. Uh, it was late 16, and we dominated the sand drags out there. <laughs> Again, you know, and this car had just been released, and we, we kind of put together a quick and dirty E85 tune. And the, the car, nobody beat us at the sand drags, you know, which was, which was amazing. And so, but even then, we didn't know how far we could push the engine, you know, without stuff breaking. And, and honestly... And you'll see this in any industry. When, when a manufacturer produces a great engine, you will see, like, an entire industry grow up around that. And that's part of the reason why the Polaris kind of lagged a bit once the Can-Am, because it was very horsepower limited, right? right. At a certain point, you just start breaking things. There was no components to replace it with at the time. Uh, but whereas the Can-Am, we could keep putting more and more and more power to them, and they, they're, they're still reliable, you know? Right. So uh, we were talking, the last podcast we did with uh, Brian Crower, right? He was yeah. talking about, you know, how Polaris needs those high horsepower components and the Can-Ams just want to stay ahead. <laughs> like they're just, they're right. just we want to go faster, faster, faster. So what have you seen as far as trends? go? Well, before I get into that, what have you seen? We just talked about Polaris versus Can-Am yeah. and how the that how platform has created a tribe around it, right? Yep. Like, what have you noticed online? What's the differences between, like, the, what you're hearing on the Can-Am versus Polaris and all that? Well, obviously, there's, like, a rival between Polaris <laughs> and Can-Am people, that's for sure. And it's all over the groups and things like that. But you can definitely see that there's more of a Can-Am presence on social media than there is Polaris presence. It is growing, especially when the Pro XP released, um, but a lot of Can-Am. Yeah, and they're wow. not shy of being vocal either. No. <laughs> they're, they're pretty proud of their platform. <laughs> no. so. and, and rightly so. I mean, it's an amazing platform. Um, Provides but, great memes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's like, there's no shortage of memes here at the show either. So, yeah. um, But going to uh, the, the horsepower and the blocks and the reliability side of it, um, you know, how do you guys approach upping the game on these motors and these tunes and stuff? Where do you, where do you draw the line on you know, providing power versus reliability, and, and how do you approach that kind of consumer product? Well, it, it, it obviously goes into the testing of the product, right? So, so and it's not, you know, you're, you're not starting from, like, ground zero on, on everything, right? It's, a, you know, we, we had a pretty extensive background with my brother's company in high-performance, you know, turbo modification. So there's, there's kind of a roadmap that you take, but you don't know where the thresholds are until you actually exceed them. And, and one of the things that, you know, we, we, we in back in 2000, uh, late 16, you know, we had a Polaris drag car that we had built and, you know, we broke it and, and, and it was the crankshaft. And so, and then we broke another crankshaft and, 
um, and I'm not bagging on Polaris, but we found the limitation of that engine pretty quickly, and there wasn't components to, at the time, I mean, thanks to Brian Crower now, you know, there's components, you know, he's billet crankshafts that can solve that problem. Back in, in 16, there was nothing out there to fix that, right? It is what it is. We've never broken a crankshaft on, a, on an X3, never. Really? Okay, and that's including our, you know, that's including this car that went five sec, you know, did a five second eighth mile stock crankshaft. Right. So, um, so that's, you know, like I said earlier, when whenever the manufacturer gives us an engine that's bulletproof, there will be a whole market that explodes around it. Same thing with the original uh, Z1 Articat engine. Right. That's like legendary. People still use it. People still half, say they want to find them. <laughs> to put right. them in. And, and half the Sand Outlaws, uh, Outlaw class cars are Z1 cars, you know, because they built an engine that, you know, was bulletproof. Right. And, you know, we were talking, when I was talking with Crower, we were talking about how the racing scene really can't, like, take off and it, it, it can't have a fire unless it's, like, everybody's using the same uh, chassis and designs and, and, and components, right? Like they have to have a commonality where everybody can build off of and compete against each other. And I think that's where we're getting to where we had the stage of the manufacturers all just throwing everything at the wall to see what's gonna grow, what's gonna live longer, what's gonna go faster. And now, uh oh so what was I saying? <laughs> Great question. Uh, so, so the, so the industry, and we're back, uh, by the way. So, um, so the industry really needs a platform to build components and 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 thrive off of. And once everybody can do that, it seems like the 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 sport will just progress a lot faster. So now we're at a point where you know you guys can come in, other tuners can come in, other parts manufacturers can start coming to market and bringing. Um, I don't want to say like a crate style program, but more or less a you know, we're going to be able to supply all the parts that you need. Um, where do you see racing going? I mean, it's exploded over the last couple of years. Where do you see it going now that it's actually getting traction under it? Eh? See what I did there? Traction? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, that's the cool thing about, you know, the off-road community is it's not just one type of racing, right? So, you know, most of the best in the desert Baja cars, they're not looking to strengthen the engine, right? They don't need that. You know, they're, they're content running 200, 250 horsepower, which is well within the capability of a, you know, relatively stock Can-Am or Polaris, okay? They need, you know, the Lone Stars, the S3s, the, you know, the CT Raceworks. They need those companies to build the, the suspension components and, and the frame and everything else strong because they're going to be going through the desert, um, you know, hitting, you know, huge bumps and everything else so so that's one aspect of the racing obviously the drag racing is something entirely different that's that takes some of those components as well but it's mainly centered around the clutching and the the engine package and the engine management system you know that you know so you know i i continue to see i think the next big thing for um you know the side by side is going to be some street racing right. you know there's a big interest in uh, you know, this car that did five second, eighth mile. I mean, that's a big deal. First side by side to do that. Um, so I see more of that because a, a, a customer can build a five second car for less than a hundred grand, right? You can't, you can't build a, a, you know, a street car for that kind of money. You know what I mean? Right. So and, um, and we talked uh, on the podcast with, with Brian about, you know, it, this is almost like the new default platform for people to build off of right like right. it's 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 changed the perspective of people entering the market of either racing or or dragging or uh short course or whatever uh now we're getting more and more interest in the pavement side of things yep um and and it's funny once you put a car out there that has a record now everybody wants to beat it and everybody wants to claim the title right right and uh so now there's a huge interest in that and uh, I was just talking the other day about, you know, you go to the, you know, I don't know, you go to your local fairgrounds and watch a demo derby or, a, or whatever. Those are the, the only things that are really keeping these racetracks alive these days are these right. like sideshows that come in. Um, and, you know, who knows in the next five years, maybe we have uh, a circle track a series or a, a rally course series that goes into these little arenas, right? Um, the, the sky is kind of like open-ended for any of these guys that want to start a whole new 
industry of racing or competitive sports, right? Exactly. And I think that uh, the platform itself is, is like we were talking about, uh, the new de facto, like if you're gonna try to do something fast and new, you're gonna almost always start looking here first versus, you know, am I gonna jump into a truck platform or a car platform right. or a, a foreign car platform or whatever. Or a motorcycle platform. Or a motorcycle, right? Like, <laughs> you know, and, and, and all those industries, you know, typically if you go back and look at the numbers, they were all trending downwards yep. as far as uh, consumer adoption, all new buyers, people coming to market. And UTV has not slowed down one iota, and if anything, it's getting exponential, right? Yeah. So um, let's jump into a little bit of uh, kind of what the product set looks like right now. What um, what what platforms are you covering, and what uh, what's kind of like your big key sellers? Well, you know, it's anything to do with the the factory turbos, right? So the Can M X3 Polaris Razor Turbo. That's that's most of what our products are, are centered around. Although we do tuning and and parts for a lot of, you know, like even the utility vehicles, like we, the Defenders and the Rangers and, you know, even some of the ATVs. So so we have a pretty diverse um, set of vehicles that we, that we do tuning for, but kind of a more limited set that we build parts and accessories for. So, uh, and like I said, mainly centered around the, the factory turbocharged vehicles. I wish that, um, you know, uh, Kawasaki would have come out with a factory turbo. I think they could have challenged Polaris had they done things, had they, it seems like the Japanese companies are more afraid to, to get into that or they don't care, you know, to get into that market. It's almost like they're not really concerned with competing per se as more as just satisfying their market's needs. And, and that's what I've noticed. Like you look at Honda, you look at Kawasaki, uh, you know, their cars are, are phenomenal cars. Like if you compare them to the industry, like they're a great car, a great solution for a niche. Every, every manufacturer kind of has a niche. And, uh, but they're not really focused on like beating Polaris or Can-Am at anything specific, right? They, com they compete and they'll participate because that's part of, you know, the marketing mechanism of, of putting a car out there. Um, but like at the show here, we see, uh, you know, over at the Maxxis booth over here, they have a, a turboed uh, KRX and, yep. and putting down possibly 190 down, right? That's that's going to be a good good little unit. It's a little big, it's a little, <laughs> little heavy, but, uh, you know, it depends on how you drive it. So, um, you know, talking about like a Kawasaki, right? Like we, we say that they should just come with a factory turbo. But they're known for all those supercharged bikes, right? Like, what's what are you? What's your perspective I, I on that? I would love that. I, I think that had they come to market with a four-cylinder supercharged KRX, that would have been something. They would have had a chance because you look at what Can Am did, right? They didn't. They weren't going to be content with going for like they could have released a Defender or they could have released like a lower horsepower model first. Okay, right. but no, they went for the absolute top which was the xp turbo at the time they dethroned the xp turbo and then they then that basically that shine went on the rest of their product line and now can am is like you know i don't know what the relative numbers are but like i said before what you know when we used to go to glamis it was 90 10 okay now it's 50 50 you know it's, yeah. it's a polaris and can am game that's right. it well, it's definitely become a more territorial thing. Like, you go to the dunes, you're mostly going to see Can-Am guys tearing it up. You'll see all the Polaris, you'll see the guys with the Talons or whatever, but you'll know, you'll know who's dominating, and it's always going to be the Can-Ams. You go to the mountains up where we live, right, you're almost always going to see a Polaris, and you're almost yeah. rarely going to see a 72-inch wide Can-Am, right? right? You go to the East Coast, you're going to mostly see little 900s and, and mules and, and KRXs and yep. stuff like that. So it's gotten a lot more instead of like one car that kind of covers the whole country, it's gotten a lot more niche. And one of the predictions we had last year was like the OEs are gonna definitely start honing in on these target markets, right? And now we're seeing that with the desert versions of the cars and the mud versions of the cars and the, all those types of things. Um, speaking of mud, do you guys tune for mud? Like, is that a market that you guys go for? Yeah, you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's a very niche market, but it's it a very is. specific power in it, band. It, it is. We have uh, we have a great um, so so no, I you know, I'm a clean guy. I like my stuff <laughs> nice and clean. I'm not willing to spend two days, you know, cleaning my car after you know running through the mud. You don't have her just take it over to the detail shop. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had like those kind of people that I could just you know jump. In. But um, no, uh, the mud market's actually, I mean, S3 was very big or is very big into that. They, they always have been. Uh, we do work with a number of top racers in the mud market that are completely dominating right now in, in the high horsepower range. I mean, there's a couple of five, 500, 550 horsepower cars. Uh, Byron Starrett is, is, is our guy. He's got a whole race team. 
and they are completely dominating uh, these big tire and little tire. They're dominating everything. So one of the the more recent things is you guys took over the I think the sand drags at Mid America, right? Yes. And uh, and so they just put in a mud uh, mud course over yeah, there. I was there and, a couple weekends ago. Yeah, and and so it, that that kind of like competition. Com competition in the mud is what intrigues me like just the mud bog like the straight line stuff yeah like i'm not really into that but you put some logs in there you put some tires in there it, it, it was awesome it I, looks I, like a good time it's a yeah but not for me <laughs> <laughs> you'll watch <laughs> i'll watch <laughs> so uh speaking of that you know what was what what happened at mid america what are you guys doing there and, and what's that look like going into 22 yeah so mid america is an amazing place it really is they they have um uh, done, you know, they've taken, you know, a, a really nice piece of land and made this like the Disneyland of, of uh, the outdoor community, which is amazing. So not only is it a great race place, but like I went there with my wife and uh, another couple friend of ours and they like, so you just, have you been there? I haven't been there yet, but I know all about it. So man, so the race course or the short course race, they actually drained a lake to, right. to build this. Okay? Right. They geoformed the whole place. <laughs> and, and then they put a pool in with like a lazy river and the pool deck overlooks, overlooks the race the short course. course. Right. So where else can you find a lazy river that overlooks a short course? <laughs> you, you can't find it anywhere else but mid-America. So yeah. and um, uh, and so their dedication to racing um, doesn't end there. Right. They put in that mud pit. OK. Uh, next year, they're putting a full quarter mile drag strip. Uh, a 300, uh, an eighth mile drag strip, and then a 330 foot sand drag strip. Separate, so, stri separate strips. You, they could right. do, you could do actually multiple racing events at the same time. Exactly. So you can do a full asphalt race, or you could do, you know, uh, the sand drag. So, which is going to be great next year. Uh, it's going to be up near where the mud pit is. Okay. Uh, but they're going to have enough run out so that you know, if you're doing quarter mile, you know, you, you can shut down. Yeah. So are they going to be doing actual like uh, automotive racing there too? I don't know. I it doesn't seem like it. I mean, it, it's it's they're geared pretty honed toward... in on the off road yes. community for this specific location. Yep, and they have great trails there too. And um, yeah, there's big plans, even bigger plans for that off road park that I can't really talk yeah. about. <laughs> Speaking of things that we can't really talk about, uh, you know. Right around the corner, we're going to see a new generation of vehicles coming out yeah. from these manufacturers, right? Um, and, and, you know, you can look at the rumors, you can look at whatever, but we can basically assume that we're going to start seeing much more um, untapped potential to start getting into, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to see new blocks, we're going to see different cylinder configurations, um, different, um, asp you know, naturally aspirated or turbo options. Um, you know, kind of what are you seeing the, tr the industry trending towards and where, where are you excited about the industry going into like 20, the middle of 22 into 23 and, and where are you guys projecting your, your eye, your sights on, on as far as, you know, performance? That's a great question. I mean, I, I, I've got a lot of thoughts about it. You know, I don't well, know. Let's if they're, talk about them. I don't know if they're coherent <laughs> or not, but, but one of the things, so, so what I think Can-Am did right and Polaris does right is they have these Razor, the, the Ranger and the Defender HVAC packages. Okay. Right. Which I think is a big deal. Uh, you know, like I, I could have used an HVAC in Oklahoma when, last week when it was a hundred degrees. On well, the and, and that's my, my very point. We were down there, you know, I, I had my Defender. It was, you know, nice and air conditioning. It was humid outside. You know, my wife and I were in the car. It was great. You know, yeah. um, so you know, the rumors are, you know, Polaris is going to be, you know, big 80 inch wide or, you know, a bigger car. My hope is that they they include more of those amenities in in the car. I mean, I think that's where the industry wants to go. Like if, like if they offered, uh, you know, full 80 inch wide with, you know, 300 horsepower power windows like my Defender has and a, and a full HVAC package, um, I'd be all about that. You know, I and and. I don't know what the street legal thing looks like, but but honestly, I that's where I would like to see the industry go. I because if you could have them be street legal, and so that you could take your car, let's just say to Glamis, uh, but then you got to go into Brawley to get you know to get um, uh, groceries. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, you take your side by side down there, right? Rather than you know having to take a motorhome or or your toy hauler or whatever. Um, I think it's intriguing. I don't know where it's at. I mean, obviously, Polaris has the slingshot, which is street legal. Motorcycles are street legal. Why not side by sides? They're they're probably a lot safer than than motorcycles or the slingshot because you have a full roll cage right. around you. So one of the things that 
I've projected is that, you know, when this, this off-road UTV market kind of took off, it was at the benefit of Polaris investing a lot of lobbying power yeah. to, to get regula regulations formed so that there was boundaries to work within, right? Like, yep. you can't build an industry unless you have the governmental, you know, boundaries set so that you can actually start progressing into them. Yes. Um, do you think that, I, I believe that, that we're going to see them putting a lot of horsepower into the lobbying side of things to say, you know, these bigger cars are where our market wants us to go. We want to operate in that area, but we want you guys to tell us how to operate so that, so that we're not competing with EPA regulations and, and safety rollover regulations and airbag regulations and you know all that crazy stuff. Right. Um, because you basically say you know let us let us live in that 35 45 mile an hour regulated area. Like right? we don't need to go on the highway. We all want to go on the highway. Well, but <laughs> I, I, I would like to go on the highway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and like I said, it, go, it goes back to motorcycles. I mean, motorcycles have been around since the you know early 1900s. So I get that. That's all been grandfathered in. But if you look at you know a side by side. You know, most of them have four-point harnesses. You're, you're surrounded by a full, you know, impact-ready uh, safety cage. There's more safety in, in a side-by-side -side than there is in Any either motorcycle. the slingshot or a motorcycle. Right. So, so why, not, why not let that be a part of it? You know, it's going to be more roads on the, ve on, uh, you know, more vehicles on the road, but it's what, it's what consumers want. It's you what know. consumers want, and it feeds you know your tabs and your and your licensing and and all the things that pay for you know some of these resources. And you know one of the one of the things that's coming down the pipe is the conversion to hybrid and electric vehicles. Yep. And they're looking for ways to supplement those taxes, right? Like they're they're saying we need to upkeep these roads. How can we? This is a great way to supplement that. You know, allowing uh, a growing and exploding market to come in. Uh, we can only hope and, and pray that they're not going to just shut us down on the EPA stuff. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, electrification is not too far down the road. I mean, it's hard to judge, you know, how um, how far that is. You know, my my suspicion is three to five years before we really start to see some some serious vehicles. But, you you know, you can't, you know, there's a couple of technology hurdles that are really difficult to get around. And that's where do you charge it? You know, right. how far can you go in the sand? My suspicion is not very far. Twenty miles, maybe. Especially you with a heavy foot. Especially with a heavy foot. I mean, there's so much drag in the in the sand. So and that, you know, so it'll be interesting to see how that works itself out. But you know, I would say limited. You know, Polaris already has a, an electric vehicle. Right. It's not a perform. I don't care about the. You know, I want the performance <laughs> vehicles. That's right. what I'm concerned. I'm about. super stoked on on the electric electrification of these. I think hybrids the future of these cars, like mm -hmm. where we're going, building these motors to power an electric system that then generates your torque is is where the future is in my opinion sure um are you guys looking at you know where that's going are you For experimenting sure. with anything are you uh, i would in? say not at this time i mean I, like i said it, it you know you're going to necessitate a much heavier car to go to that like like the um um the one that was here a couple of years ago the nicola that car was six thousand pounds or right. five thousand pounds, right? right? That's that's like as much as a three quarter ton truck. Right. You you know what I'm saying? So so it's it's. Um, well, good thing that never came to market. <laughs> <laughs> right, but that you know, so those are technology. Those are hurdles that are going to be unique to the off road industry. They're not, you know, the road cars are not going to. Um, they they don't care. Right. right. We care about that stuff because it's just going to mean more drain on the battery when you're trying to go through the sand. You right. know, if you're dragging around a six thousand pound car, so. Well, yeah, I, I think there's definitely a, a potential market that we're going to see, and it, and it probably is five years away or whatever. Yep. But we have some people coming in, like Segway, that has both a you know a naturally aspirated motor, but then also a hybrid version of it to yep. to give you a lot lower torque or a higher torque on the low end. Um, and I'm excited to see those players come to the game, you know, and, and see what they bring. Um, K9 Racing also has uh, a hybrid car. So they're over in... In um, production? Like an actual unit? Well, they, they do those really high-end, um, you know, off-road truck-looking builds. Right, they do the fiber bodies and yeah. all that. Yeah, yep. And, and so I believe they've been working with... Um, hybrid technology for a while. They have a front uh, front transaxle that they do. Hopefully I'm not telling something secret. But. <laughs> well, you look into that and I'll beep it out if we do. <laughs> so so. I, I, let off, I let off this section of the podcast with a speaking of things we can't talk about, so it just fits right in. <laughs> Um, so with the uh, with the community being very active in, you know, the development and wanting to test stuff like our community is very, very open to trying new things and, and experimenting and and 
you know, not necessarily getting something that's proven yet, but willing to try it. Um, you know, what kind of things are you seeing from the customer as far as what they want from people like Evo and, and the performance markets? What are they asking you for? 2021 Turbo RR2. <laughs> <laughs> Late model. <laughs> yep, yep. I, I can't say I didn't hear like three people ask you guys that on the way in, but yeah. That's so. really been the big topic of conversation lately. There hasn't been like, I haven't seen a lot of like posts and things like that asking about, you know, our side of things. It's been a lot of, you know, like tires and other right. things like that that we don't really cater to that I see on the groups. But when it comes to tuning and, you know, the performance side, it's really been focus on when we're going to release the rest of the product right. for, you know, 21s, 22s, things like that. So to, to, to the people that don't necessarily have that card know what's going on, KNM kind of switched the ECU up midstream on the on the Mavericks and getting prepared for 22s kind of refresh? Yeah, so I, I don't know how much KNM has to do with it. Uh, you know, it's, it's probably more on the Bosch side. You know, they want to migrate people over or companies over to this next-gen ECU, and, and it is a very cool... Uh, ECU. I mean, so it, a, it actually is a completely different unit. Completely different, you know. And and usually, like the the off road industry or the or the power sports market usually gets like seven year old automotive technology. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, I mean, this ECU is like on the latest generation BMW, right? So it's it's uh, it's cutting edge technology, and and you know, and you know, you can feel it in the car. I mean, the twenty ones they they rated them at the same one ninety five, but they're not. They're like right. another fifteen horsepower more than the, than the twenties, uh, and and the the other thing is that they keep the power and longer, right? So so you can get the car a car to make a, a dyno number, but on the twenty ones, it'll make that same number every single time you run it. You know what I mean? So um, very advanced ECU, and uh, yeah, it's a challenge. But you know, we're we're you know that's what we're all about, right? And because you guys have a lot of research to do on these things to get them to to unlock, to then Correct. import the files, to to remap, make sure all your sensors are hitting correctly. And now you have Correct. you know the smart shocks and all that stuff to deal with, where you're now having to make sure that all those numbers are flowing correctly whenever you touch it, because essentially you're doing brain surgery on the car, right? You're you're exactly. going in there and you're remapping where all those neurons are connecting in the car. Uh, so it's not a small feat per se. I mean, you guys are used to it by now. You, you kind of have your, your rhythm and how you do these things. But uh, for the consumer, I don't think a lot of us understand necessarily um, the technicality that goes into mapping the timings and the motors and, and all that stuff that goes into it and how important that is when it goes to like your engine upgrades and what you're bolting into the motor and, and how that impacts the rest of the car. It's not a small feat by any means. Yeah, I mean tuning's not easy, but but it's uh, you know it's something that we've been doing for a very long time. So yeah, you know whenever we get a new ECU like this, it's like starting from ground zero. Um, now, does it excite you when you do that, or it does is. it just frustrate no, the heck no, out it's, of you? It's exciting. I mean that, that's why you know we thought 2022 was going to be the big year for you know new uh, new Can Am, a new new Polaris. You know, we've been waiting for the new Polaris for like four years, been hearing about this thing. So, yeah, where is it? Right. <laughs> you know, it's like a Sasquatch, you know. Keep hearing one's Ooh. over here, one's over there. That sounds like you a know. new shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Talk like about it. memes, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or the car wash one on the speed car. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. That's a good Sorry, one. Robbie. Actually, we, 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 that same meme could have been used for the new Polaris. Exactly, right? <laughs> right? It's a multi-purpose meme. It's <laughs> insert name here. So I'm not, I'm just not trying to be too hard on Polaris, but. But yeah, I mean, their customers want a new car. I mean, you know, so yeah. let's let's get it's it done. It's definitely already. long on the tooth, and we've we've yeah. seen a lot of evidence of these cars coming out. And we're all super excited about it. Um, so yeah, what do you guys got coming up? Where are you guys excited to go to next? And and anything on the horizon? Maybe you want to talk about? Uh, we always have a lot of things on the horizon. I think we have about seventy products that that are you know in various stages of R and D. So very excited about that. Um, you know, Razor we. Turbo. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Razor guy's been begging for more horsepower. So I, we've actually got um, a customer car that's nearly complete uh, that's going to be a 400-horse Razor. Um, and uh, we did some billet cylinders for that, which, you know, we're going to be very cool. A lot of the Brian Crower products go into that, uh, the TPR valve cover and some other cool components. Um, so, yeah, we're excited about that. But um, And still more stuff for the Can-Am. You know, we're working on a lot of things for the Can-Am right now. Uh, we're finalizing, you know, we have the billet block, uh, which is going <laughs> to, you know, maybe we'll crack a 1,000 horsepower with that. I, that would be pretty amazing. But, that would be amazing. But we'll see. We'll see where that's at. But, 
you know, now with a billet block, we can really, there's almost no amount of boost that that engine can't take. So, but we're going to break other things in the process. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned the blocks. Uh, again, talking about something that seems like just a part you should be able to forge and buy, like that's no easy project to dive right into, a whole block system. Yeah, so so we have a, a partner um, who actually makes them for us, uh, Marion Pavlik from... Uh, um, I can't oh, remember. Here well, we go. It's, it's Motec <laughs> Middle East, but but uh, at, um, TTR CNC, right? So he he builds some of our parts for us, and he he's a super smart guy, and and you know basically uh, created that billet block, you know, for us, and um, you know, and we're super excited about it. It's an amazing piece of technology. So and he does he does Lambo blocks and and um, um, you know two JZ blocks, and you know. So, but uh, we're super excited to work with him on some of these projects because it's it's very cool. Um, so, where are you guys going next? What, I mean, we, we've kind of gotten deep into the trade show season, right? Yep. Like we're we're in knee deep on this. Where are you guys going next? Uh, like physically? Yeah. Well, besides home, <laughs> I'm going home <laughs> after this. <laughs> um, where are we going next? Well, we have a Sand Outlaws race in Utah, uh, October second. Uh, so that that'll be uh, that'll be a great race, I think. Um, you know that's Packard's home home territory, so they're going to be tough to beat there. Um, but uh, excited about that. And then you know then we're I know Camp Razor's canceled, but we're still going to be out there vending. But Glamis isn't canceled. Glamis isn't canceled. <laughs> <laughs> At least not yet. <laughs> right, right. We never know so, day to day in California. <laughs> so really excited about the upcoming Dune season. Um, you know it's it's always you know it's like. I'm like a kid in a candy store when I, we start talking about Camp Razor. So. <laughs> well, we're all looking forward to it. Um, you know, where can we get more educated on the products and the implementation of them and, and all that stuff? And where can we find, you know, you guys online and, and all that? Well, you can always find Evo Sam. <laughs> yeah, Evo Sam on Facebook. We got Evolution Power Sports on Facebook. We try to keep that updated with the new product releases and things like that. Uh, the website, we have... Um, a fantastic, you know, uh, like blog area where we are posting, trying to post more about, you know, our racers and things like that. And then we also have an instruction side of things that we've really fine tuned. So if you do have any questions on products, everything should be laid out in the instructions tab on the website. Um, and that's Instagram. a good place to go if you're looking at, you know, possibly doing some of these upgrades. Um, one of the best things you can do is find a, a, a performance partner that has the educa educational materials up front. Right, like you're not having to buy and then investigate. You can actually look up front. Okay, this is exactly how this is going to lay out for me over the next two weeks. How am I going to do this? And, and, and kind of get an idea of, of what you're getting into. Yeah. Yeah. So we've really invested a lot of uh, time and effort into our website to make it better. Uh, it's you know that's an ever evolving uh, thing. Um, you know, for the dealers, we're launching a dealer portal later this year, which is a big deal. You know, right now, you know, the process for ordering is not great. I mean, usually dealers have to either send us a PO right. or, um, or you know, call and speak to our sales staff, which, you know, we're all obviously always willing to, to talk to them. A lot of fun but, <laughs> talking to our dealers every day. It is. It but, is. I enjoy our dealers a lot. But, um, you know, having them be able to log in, see their pricing, and, and place orders right right from our website would be, is an amazing deal. I, I think yeah. it'll be great for them, great for us. It'll eliminate a lot of, um, you know, some of the human error that takes place when you're, you know, taking phone orders, um, you know. So I, I think it'll make the dealer experience a lot better. Yeah, so. coming from the IT world and building websites and dealer systems and all this other stuff, I can tell you that, like, that's one of the top three things a dealer's looking for is a good way to interact with the business side of things, right, and, and be educated guarantee the parts, know their shipping times, know everything that's involved. Um, and yeah, that, that's exactly where dealers are always looking to be. And, and it's a bit of a challenge right now because even though we, we um, you know, we went he heavy on inventory, you know, ever since COVID, it's, you know, now we're starting to really run into some supply chain issues. Like it's getting, it's getting worse, you know, like turbos, for example, or, very long lead times right now and some some components that we need are you know like cylinder sleeves you know like 90 days 120 days uh where they used to be you know uh, 30 days you know right. so but you know we're managing that and and um you know the demand's still there so we're going to keep pushing forward 
Well, I'm super excited to be here at the show, seeing everybody, you know, face to face. It's always yeah. a good, good time, and um, getting to see some of these cars that you only see online. Yeah. You know, that's one of the benefits of going to a show like this, right? You get to see and 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 kind of examine the cars that you've seen built online and perform, outperform other people. And yep. it's always like the race car here. Um, this is a. Why don't you give us a little rundown of this car, real quick? This is a pretty unique car. It is. So so Jason Smith from Midwest Performance, you know, he brought us, uh, this was one of the original 2018 120 models. And, um, you know, he had the idea, he wanted to build, um, you know, the fastest eighth second car that was in existence, right? right? And so, you know, this was pretty early on in, in the development stage of the X3. So, you know, we got him, you know, 400 horsepower at the time, but but unfortunately that's not enough. To, to get into the five. So right. so we've been uh, building this car with him over the last few years and finally got it to the place where we actually set a record with it. So, um, but and, and who certifies that? Like, is it just the fact that it, you can... Well, it was done at a, at a racetrack. So, right. so okay, there so you're is... on a full timing system with a exactly. slip and everything. Yep. And so we're looking at the car here and, you know, it looks like a typical race X3 as, you know, it's low, it's, it's uh, you know, the seats are taken out of it, you get all the race hardware's on it. Yep. Um, you have, uh, what are those, or orb struts or? Uh, those are actually hill shooters. Okay. Um, so, uh, yep. And then I believe the rims are OMF. I Hopefully, hopefully they're <laughs> OMF. Uh, <laughs> S3 Power Sports provided, you know, the suspension components, but like the engine package, uh, you know, all the tuning, uh, fuel system, turbocharger, you know, all of that we designed and, and uh, all, you know, the whole clutch package. Clutching is uh, STM, or the clutches are STM, but we did all of the, the tuning on the clutches. And, and you um, talked earlier about the, and I've talked with Crower and a bunch of other people about, you know, once you make the horsepower, how does it get transferred to the ground, right? And that's through that that Achilles heel called the CVT. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that looks like a, uh, if you just walk by, you're like, oh, a, a, a STM clutch, right? Mm -hmm. But that, what goes into perfecting the tune for a clutch like that? That's top secret. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but... but I mean, you're, we're looking at, you know, a fully braced system. We're talking yep. about custom, you know, grinds and, and weights and, yeah. and all that stuff. I, exactly. That's what it is. It's, it's getting that recipe because, like, you know, if you set up a car to, to run an eighth mile, that's not going to work for in the sand or it's not going to work for any other type of racing. Right. So so you, you got to and even to do like a zero to 60 time, if you're trying to break an eighth mile record, yeah, you care about your 60 foot time, your zero to 60, but that's not, you know, that's not where where it's done. Right. You know, it's it's through the whole. You wanted to keep getting faster exactly. and then reach maximum at the at the at the flag, right? Correct. And and part of the problem is transferring the power to the ground. You know, on a lightweight car like this, um, it's hard to get enough traction. So you got to ramp that po you know power in over the first second, um, you know, of the run. So and even even a little bit farther out because you know if you look at the video of the run, uh, Dan, our you know who does uh, all of our race stuff, he was uh, the car was all over the track. I mean he stayed at the whole, I mean he was going back and forth, you know because the track was slippery and and he was right on that verge of traction the entire way down he was the floating, track basically. Yeah. So. So um, how light is that car? How wide? How light? Um, boy, I think it's it's probably around. 1,450 pounds. I was guess I would around say. 1,415. Yeah, yeah, so. it's super cool and it's for sale. So if you ever, if you want to win at the drag strips and the new upcoming pavement scene, uh, this is the car to come by. <laughs> <laughs> so well, it sounds like we're getting pushed out decibel wise by our yeah. neighbors. <laughs> um, so we'll wrap up the show. Uh, you can find you guys on evolutionpowersports.com, right? Yeah, it's evopowersports.com. Evo 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 yep. uh, and then uh, evo underscore powersports on on social and uh, all that. Just just search evo and it pops up first or second and uh, Evo Sam is probably like third or fourth somewhere. Um, and uh, so go, everybody go like her account and then start trolling her DMs. It'll be greatly appreciated. Uh, and uh, yeah, it looks like it's going to be a great show uh, for the rest of the weekend. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys out on the drags uh, yep. and some of that competitiveness. You're going to be out there? Uh, uh, I won't be at that that one, but I'll be around. Okay. Put it that way. Sounds um, good. So uh, I always love the back and forth between all the different groups and, and the trash talking is always a, a fun way to entertain yourself on a, on a late night scroll through social media. Exactly. So. <laughs>
<laughs> it's um, entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> so check them out online. Check out their tunes. One of your most, one of my favorite products, you guys, is the, the, that you put out for the Can-Ams is the 3R tune. Uh, you know, it's such a reliable, high, high impact on your car. You can really feel it out the door. So if you got a Can-Am, check that out. Uh, stay tuned to their social media for this potential. Uh, Polaris platform update coming out, um, and uh, the boys up in the northwest are going to be uh, are taking that car for their customer and all that. So I'll be checking yep. that car out uh, on our side. You can find the podcast on Google, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, anywhere you can find your podcast. We're there. We're on YouTube. If you're watching, thank you for liking and subscribing. And uh, until the next time, guys, peace.